Welcome to the Tribe of Testimonies. Here you will find conversations with faithful Native American members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, sharing their stories and their love of the Savior. My name is Andrea Hales. I'm Navajo, and I'm glad that you've decided to come and join us today. I am in my home today with Calista Hill. I am so happy that you're here because you are just a friend now. I'm so thankful. Will you please introduce yourself in your tribal way as much as possible? If it's in your language, great. If it's not, that's fine. Not everybody speaks their language and some languages are dead. Hi, thank you so much for having me here today with you. It's wonderful to be here in your home. And my name is Kalista Hill and I am a mother to six children. They range in age from three to um, the oldest, she is 15, and she'll be 16 soon, and my youngest will be four. They actually share a birthday, so there's exactly 12 years between my youngest and my oldest. And then I have, um, so three boys, three girls, the other ages are five, um, see, eight, nine, and then I have a 13-year-old along with a 15-year-old. So I've been married... um, almost like next month will be 17 years and um, my husband works for the U.S. government and so for our most of our married life we've been living overseas. Our first post was Australia and then after that we were back in the U.S. for a couple years and then we moved to the Philippines then after there we went straight to Malaysia and then after Malaysia my husband did a one-year unaccompanied uh, tour to Afghanistan and we came came back to um, the U.S. We were in Utah for that year, and then we moved to Bolivia, and that was during COVID, and so that was kind of an adventure. That was in December 2020. (laughs) An an adventure on top of an adventure. (laughs) Yes, yes, it really was. We talked a little bit earlier about all the extreme COVID measures in Bolivia at the time that we moved there, and then so that was supposed to be a three-year tour, and then... um, my nephew, my sister's seven-year-old son, he passed away in his sleep, and that was then very hard on my whole family. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, and so after that, I just was struggling in Bolivia, and we decided to come back a little early, so we curtailed, and we have been in Utah since last summer, and we are loving being in Utah. It's been really great change reverse culture shock for my me and my kids but yeah. it's been really great to be to be here in Utah yeah. so yeah and which tribe oh yes of course that's very important <laughs> sorry about that yeah so Yankton and Lakota but our tribal affiliation in terms of enrollment is with the Yankton side but we're Yankton and Lakota and very proud of that cool so, that's yeah great yeah how did you find my podcast that is a really good question. My husband is a big podcast listener, and he one day had sent it to me, and I was like, oh, this is so cool. I'm going to listen to it, and then I forgot about it, and so it was actually, yeah, after my nephew passed away that I like was just feeling really sad. We had church was still virtual um, most of the time we were in Bolivia and I was just having a hard time. So I'd listen to one or two, but then I like really went back and listened to so many of them after he died. And so that's when I was like, this is the coolest podcast ever. So when I, and I knew you're in Utah. So being here in Utah, that's why I reached out to you. So yeah, we're pretty close now. Yeah. We're like 12 minutes away. Yeah, not, not Bolivia to Utah. <laughs> yeah. Yep, yep. Exactly. Very close now, which is great. Yeah. So what do you love about your heritage as it relates to the gospel of Jesus Christ? It can be pretty much anything, a story, celebration, a way of life, a ceremony. What do you love about your heritage? That's a very good question. Um, There's a couple things for me that come to mind, but the first one is that I actually wouldn't have met my husband if it wasn't for my heritage. Because, That's cool. Yeah. Nobody has said that yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's always fun to shake things up with a new story. No, just kidding. But um, no. So basically, um, I was going to school at Weber State. And my grandfather, he had always talked to me a lot about um, like Native American adoptions because his mother had 
been put in boarding school at five. And that was really hard for her. She was like punished immediately for speaking her native tongue. They weren't allowed. She didn't know. She, you know, so she asked someone to like, please pass the salt at the dinner table. And then the nun beat her. It was really horrible. And anyway, so she was a second generation boarding school. Um, Her mother had also been taken in boarding school. Anyway, so he talked to me about the Indian Child Welfare Act of 1978 and how after that, like, after bull because after boarding schools, so many Native children were still taken, but they were just put in white families, not in boarding schools, but they were just put in white families. And so he talked about the Indian Child Welfare Act and how that was like a good thing. And so I just had known about it because we had talked about it quite a bit. So when I was going to school... And had to write a research paper for my English class. I decided to do it about that topic. And afterwards, um, my teacher was like, this is amazing. Like, you should do an undergraduate research grant and do a research project about this topic and see how Utah's complying with the Indian Child Welfare Act currently. And I thought that sounded like way too much work, but she was very, (laughs) she was like very pushy about the idea, but also was like, I will help you. You're like, sure, if I go straight to my PhD program. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. It's like, why, why do I go through this extra work? I have other classes, but, but she was like, it's a paid, you know, they'll give you money. And plus like, it'll be so great. And it is a topic that I've always been passionate about. Yeah, it is actually important. I was like, this would be kind of cool to see. And my grandpa was very excited. He's like, yes, I will help you. And so then we even talked about it things even more and so I went ahead with it she helped me find a mentor and got that done I did that it was a one semester research project and then after that um you could get all that done in one semester it was just like oh yeah you had only had that one semester it was short yeah (laughs) it was like that's how they would do it it's like in the next semester let's see what you can do so that's why it was a big commitment of extra time for sure because it wasn't like yeah it wasn't like that's all I was doing full time I still had all my other classes that I didn't want to like fail because I was doing this research project so it was a lot of work but it was really cool and afterwards when it was completed Completed, then she was looking over like everything and was like, you know what, you need to apply to the um, undergraduate posters on the hill. It's like this um, big event where they will just every all the undergraduate research projects in the US, you can like apply and they will just pick, I think it was like 30 students or something like that that go to Washington DC and they present their research and I was just like I was like that seems like even more work but my grandpa's (laughs) like oh I'll help you write the abstract like I you know he was just like all enthusiastic and I was like well I guess it doesn't hurt to try I mean it wasn't expected that I would be selected for it but I thought I might as well Uh and then like a month or something passed and then they reached out and said that they wanted me to present my that research on Capitol Hill and so then the school was excited. I mean, they were like, great, this is great for our school because um, I don't think Weaver State had been, had a Ever student. selected. Yeah, or at least not in a long time. Um, so they were excited about it. And so then I went to D.C. and well, I loved job, it. good job, Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> Thanks. But it was an exciting time. Like, that sounds like a lifetime ago, though. <laughs> yeah, it feels like it. I'm like, it really does. <laughs> I'm like, that was so long ago and so much, you know, life has happened since then. But anyway, um, so yeah, so I presented there. They had a couple faculty went out with me, and I loved D.C. It was so cool. They showed me around, and it was a fun experience. And then I just went back to focusing on school. And then one day, I randomly got this email. I had gone to UVU for one semester before I transferred to Weaver State, And in that time, I'd never gotten any emails from UVU, like none, because like, why would they email me? But it was this email and it was like internship opportunity in Washington, D.C. with Senator Bennett. And I was thinking like, wow, like that, I love D.C. That would be so cool. But I was trying to, I was getting ready to go on a mission. I'd already done my papers and I was thinking about leaving right when I turned 21. Um, So I only had a couple months till my birthday, whereas this would have meant that I had to postpone my mission. But I didn't think I would probably even be selected for that internship because same thing that I knew was the scouts were going to four schools and they were only picking four students. So they went to BYU, UVU, Utah State, and um, BYU. And so 
anyway, so it was basically, it was busy time. I really should have just focused on school, but I just kept feeling like I need to apply to this internship, which, you know, uh-huh. and I was like, but I'm not even a student at UVU anymore. Like what will like, and then I was like, well, maybe after my mission, I'll go back. Like, I don't, as long as they don't care. I mean, again, I probably won't be picked anyway, but anyway, so I went and they did select me for the internship, but I know I was only a sophomore. Most of the other applicants were all like, um, for one, they're political science majors where mm-hmm. I was a social right. work major. They're about to graduate. My grades weren't bad, but they weren't I like great. Um, and I just, but when we did the interview, I talked about going to DC and they were like, why do you want to go to DC or like, you know, be an intern. But I mentioned how much I love the city and the energy there. And when I went for posters on the Hill and presented that research, and I know that that was the deciding factor for them of why they were like, oh, okay, you have something a little interesting. Like, you know what I mean? I just think otherwise I wouldn't. So I do definitely attribute um, going there because that's where then I met my husband um, was there in DC. Um, we met at Institute. So my husband, he had already, um, knew he was going to Australia for, um, like his three, that three year assignment, but, um, he was just back in DC in that short time and we just met at Institute. And so, yeah. Wow. So it was, yeah, it was kind of great timing. It just happened. It's funny how things happen like that. Like if, if this just had it happened a little bit differently yes exactly yeah because I don't I mean I yeah I just felt like that was the purpose and the mission was really important to me and then when I met him I was like okay this is what like I'm supposed to do is to is to get married instead and yeah it was pretty neat so you're both there in DC at the same time for a summer yeah, he was, it was like in the fall and he, yeah, so we kind of had a short, shorter engagement because I needed to like get on his orders and be able to get to uh-huh. like Australia. We knew it was like, it would be a very, very long distance relationship otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> so we met in October and then we were married that next April. Yeah. So yeah, it was pretty short time frame. <laughs> I mean, that's not that short. That's six yeah. months. Yeah, six months. That's. Did you grow up in Utah? Yeah, I did. did. We mostly were in eastern Utah, like in Price, Sarah, Utah that's County right, for the younger right. part of my childhood. And then we were there. So, yeah, I was homeschooled, but otherwise would have like graduated from high school in Price. And then, yeah, started off in college. And were you raised as a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints? I was. Yeah, I was. I um. Yeah, I was baptized when I was eight. My family was on and off about being as active in church. So mm-hmm. we were we moved to Price and we didn't really go to church. I sometimes went with my grandparents. But um, it was actually when I was 14 that I started to go to church first on my own. It was mm-hmm. kind of an answer to a prayer. I was just like, because we were homeschooled, I was pretty lonely at the time um, and I wanted to go to church, but we weren't going to be there very long. My mom was like, well, we're going to be moving soon. We'll go, you know, after we move. But I just remember one day I was just really sad and I went outside at night and I was looking at the stars and then I prayed. I just prayed that like, Heavenly Father, I want like friends and, you know, like can... I don't know how you help me have friends, but if you can help me have friends, that would be wonderful. And then literally like that week, there was a knock on the door and it was the young woman in our ward. A couple of them were bringing like had some plate of cookies and they were inviting me to an activity like it was a pajama of youth activity. And I was so excited. I was like, wait, I can't believe this. Like because we had been I guess our records had been in the ward. I don't know how long, but it was just that week that they were like, I don't know. These girls are or this girl. Well, it was just me because my my younger sister wasn't you know I'm 12 yet but but just to realize how oh, I wonder who this girl is let's go go Aww. meet her so that was a really special for me because I was like wow prayers are answered you know yeah so it was really cool so I started going and then my sister wasn't too long until she turned 12 and then she started going with me and then my brother he started going back to church and then he served a mission in South Korea. Oh, that's so And during so his awesome. mission, my mom became active again, and yeah. Oh, that's so awesome. So it was a good. <laughs> because yeah. you prayed. Yeah, isn't that amazing? Huh? Yeah. There's a lot of power in prayer, and yeah. it was nice to learn that when I was young to help me get through, you know, other hard things later in life, so. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. 
So, so you guys have served the United States in various countries. Yeah. What are some of your favorite experiences that you want to share about that? All the countries we've lived, we've had a lot of very varied experiences. But if I'm thinking about an experience that has been the most like kind of life changing in terms of just my perspective of the world, because when you do live overseas, you naturally have a different perspective than if you just go on vacation somewhere, you can get a feel for a place, but you have to kind of live somewhere to really um, know the people in a certain way. I know like missionaries, they obviously, you know, they get that. That's why their missions mean so much to them Mm -hmm. is because of that. And um, all the places we lived were special in many ways, but the Philippines is a very poor country and the people are very humble and wonderful. And the same with like all the places, but in the Philippines, they pretty much um, mostly in Manila will speak English. So it's easier to have really? interactions. Yeah, pretty much everyone, even taxi drivers. And yeah, it's um, they speak English other and whereas that was a big problem in um, Bolivia was the language barrier. Anyway, so the people in the Philippines really fell in love with. They're so kind and humble and just amazing um, people. But it's also such a poor country, and that was really hard to see so much. There's a lot of street kids. There's, like, thousands of kids, literally, who just roam together, who live on the street, who don't have parents taking care of them. And they kind of just band together to, like, scavenge for food as much as they can and things like that. And that's not something that we even saw in Malaysia or Bolivia, even though they're also not wealthy countries. They're not poor to that same extent. But there was one experience in the Philippines where there's a garbage dump called Smoky Mountain. And it's a dump where hundreds of families live on the dump and they just scavenge through the garbage for their livelihood. So they just have like little kind of shack kind of shelters built up on the garbage dump. But there was a charity there that I like to visit where they had a little tiny building, but it was clean, real floors. And they would um, let the children come in during the day while their parents scavenge. That way they're not just like sitting out in the trash with their parents. Like they could come in and they would bathe them and they would um, then feed them, give them food during the day. And there were some toys. So I would go and one time I had um, one of my Australian friends, she came to visit us and um, I had got these beanie babies that I wanted to go deliver to the to them. And so we were we were busy. There's so much cool stuff to do that first we were doing all the fun things. And then we decided to go and um, we were about to leave. We just played with the kids and gave them their toys. And this old woman came in and she was carrying a little baby. And it was very clear immediately that the baby was not well. And she did not speak. She was not speaking English. She was speaking in Tagalog. But one of the workers translated for me and said that she was the grandmother and that the mother had abandoned him a couple weeks earlier and that she'd had nothing to feed him. And he had just been living on like rice water. And so he was starving. And you could see that he was starving. Um he was so small and you know I just had the thought like I can't believe that this is real because you might um hear that there's kids starving other places around the world but you don't like it's different to actually see it and to feel like to feel that baby's suffering and it was just really sad and I was I was like what is going to happen to this baby and they were like well we're already over capacity I was like well how how much is it for his food because the grandmother was there like just like begging like help help him you know and I was like how much is his food and it was only an equivalent of 20 US dollars a month like they said his formula would be about 20 dollars um and I was like that is like nothing and I'm like well then I'm gonna send him money I'll send you money every month to pay for him um so that way he can still be in your program and have food And so I just gave them the equivalent of $20 and we had to leave because my friend was um, 
actually catching her flight like that day. <laughs> like we needed to hurry to the airport. So it was all very rushed, but it was just very like, I don't know. I just couldn't stop thinking about that baby and the whole weekend. So this was on like a weekend, like a Friday. And then Monday they called me and they said, I'm really sorry, but it's too late. He passed away. And my heart just broke for that baby. And I cried a lot for the next few days. And I felt like, why didn't I? Because they didn't, I guess, they didn't give him the money, like the grandma. The, I just gave them, not the grandma, the money. And they didn't give it to her till that, like, they went to go find her on that Monday or have her come back. And they said it was too late. And they they were just like, but she's very grateful that $20, like, that money will pay for his burial. And I just was like, what is this? Like, how can this be reality? And that's just one one child there. Like, that's just one, you know? And it just changed my whole worldview of, like, first world problems kind of thing. <laughs> and just made me realize, like, how, like, blessed we are just to be able to, like, feed our children. And I've just never been the same since that experience. Yeah. I don't see how you could be the same after that. Yeah. Yeah. And going back to, like... um just like our native like heritage I actually had thought a lot because one of the other things that you know was that question of like what do you love about your heritage as it relates to the gospel but I really love the values like the Lakota values like my grandfather he always talked about like gratitude that was his big thing and after he passed away I wanted to keep his um memory alive I'm kind of just not just keep his memory alive with my children but I'm like he was our tie to our heritage like how do I teach my children now that he is gone because he died in 20 like not of COVID but during COVID Uh so after that I um I thought about how he taught so many wonderful things, but he just really focused on gratitude. He had a gratitude journal that he would write every single day, something he was grateful for. So I thought about that, and then I decided to teach, like, for my children, like, I need to teach them gratitude. And so what we do is um, after we read scriptures, before we would say family prayer, we all take turns saying something that we're grateful for. And um, I just think that it's important that, we realize and my kids do just because of that you know experience with exposure that we've had to different places they see like one of like my um my nine-year-old when my husband was asking him like what do you like most about being in America and he was like I like it that people have more money and that there's not so many poor people (laughs) because even in Bolivia you know you see that so much but I think about the other like Lakota values which are like humility perseverance, respect, honor, love, sacrifice, truth, compassion, bravery, fortitude, generosity, and wisdom. And these are all Christ-like attributes. These are all attributes of him. And that's what I love. Like these are good, good ways to be. But then I also think back of like how our ancestors lived and they also didn't know where their next meal was coming from. Like they would have to like hunt. I mean, not every tribe, but like for us, it was like, you know, if you don't go get that buffalo, your people are going to be hungry. So of course, when you get that buffalo, you're going to give thanks. And it's just that simpleness of um, life, of being able to have, because humility that leads to these other attributes, right? We need to be humble to be able to also have these things like love in our hearts and uh, wisdom come you know what I mean they're all tied together so well that you can't have one without the other but just to be that humble to be relying on God to for food for just your basic sustenance and in today's world right so different in that we have so many distractions and so many nice things that we're more worried about like even someone who doesn't have money here in the U.S. may be worried like I can't get my kids the nicest things maybe the cool name brand clothes they want and things that are still like a good thing but not many people are just worried and here we have other things like food banks and there's other things but that's not like that in a lot of the world. The Philippines 
was the poorest country, but it's not the poorest country in the world, even compared to other places. It's just the poorest country we lived in. And so anyway, it's just that worldview of um, realizing how how much we have to be grateful for. And that's why gratitude is so important, <laughs> you know, and they we had state conference today and um, with the state president talked about gratitude and I just smiled because I just was thinking, cause I'd already thought about that today a lot. And again, I think of it every day, but again, like our native values go so well with our, um, with the gospel, gospel values of what we're teaching, that it's so easy to like, they, they're perfectly in harmony. And I really am grateful for that. And I love that. Yeah, I totally agree. Those are traditional things that we should never forget, like mm -hmm. never forget. Teach, exactly. teach, teach. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. It's very true. Yeah. In all of your living experiences overseas have you been able to share the gospel with anybody yes um i haven't had like one specific like missionary experience that stands out except for the in bolivia my maid um and overseas pretty much everyone has like in in like philippines they were called a, a helper like a domestic helper or in um Bolivia, they were just an empleada for Spanish. But anyways, basically, it's just very inexpensive to have help. And so that's one of the perks of living overseas, especially with a big family like me, is having someone where you're giving them a job, but it's so little in your, like, it's like your utility bill, you know? Uh -huh. and so anyways, my, my empleada, she, her mother passed away only a month after she started working for me. And she was very close to her mom and she really struggled with that and when our shipment came and we had all we have like you know beautiful pictures of Christ and you know the Philippines is or sorry Bolivia and I'm getting myself mixed up um well both the Philippines and Bolivia they're, ca they're predominantly like Catholic is the religion and Catholic and I had never been in a Catholic church until one of our trips in Bolivia actually was the first time we went in and sat in and it was like their little thing and you know like and it wasn't quite it wasn't mass but they were having some kind of service and we left and my daughter who is 12 well she was 12 was just like mom the feeling in there is so different than our church and I was like I know and like the artwork is more you know they focus on the crucifixion more and so it's very different so my maid though she had is Catholic as well, you know, but she was like, your art is so beautiful, the way you show Christ. And I just was like, yes, you know, and it's something that same thing in the Philippines, we'd have someone comment, but she wasn't on the same kind of thing. But my maid in Bolivia, she was, you know, missing her mom and, and, and struggling. And we talked so many times and I told her and I told her about the missionaries in the church. And right before we moved, I was like, you need to, you know, if you contact them, they will come and they will teach you in Spanish. And I invited her daughter had come over. She's the same age as my 12 year old. So she had, um, I had invited her over several times just if like my maid is working on a weekend to come with her and that, and, you know, cause usually she was in school and her daughter is so sweet and I'm like she would love the young women's and she would love all these things so anyways I'm glad you bring it up because since I've moved she's reached out to me several times and so you know we have um she still has my phone number and she's like says how much she misses me and the kids but I've thought about that I need to just like remind her that she needs to you know because and I'm not there's other um embassy families who have had their you know domestic help employees um become converted and I think it makes sense just because they're in your home they're seeing how you're raising your kids and that's the kind of thing she would say was like I love the feeling in your home I love you know like the way that you are with your children and um they can see that and so it's it's easy to have that be a missionary opportunity um yeah so that's just one of the things there's other other things but that's the one that stands out in my mind the most because maybe it was the most recent maybe <laughs> yeah yeah how long are you guys going to be doing overseas things like yeah, his whole career good... um yeah I don't you kind of don't know like I said we just needed I needed to be closer to family after my nephew's death and 
I wanted my kids to experience what America is like. <laughs> yeah. But they, they, I mean, when we mentioned to them, like, how would you feel about going back overseas? They're like so happy. Like, they're like, yeah, that would be amazing. Really? You know, we thought that we were thinking, though, because my daughter's in ninth grade, my oldest, uh-huh. that we would need to stay till she graduates because we wouldn't want to move like her senior year. But she was like, I don't mind moving my senior year. Like, I would love to go to another country. So I don't know. We Just because of our kids, we kind of play by ear, you know, <laughs> yeah. in terms of that. We just kind of go where we feel like we're supposed to be. And right now it was like we need to go back to the U.S. for a while. Yeah, for sure. And then, but otherwise, potentially, though, yes, until my husband retires, which is still a little ways away, we could go back over to seas to yeah. different countries. So how do you connect with the people when you live in different countries? In different countries, how do you make friends and oh yeah, have, well, have a have your yeah your circle? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, well, it's really nice. Like when you're overseas with the embassy, there's like a strong embassy community where they do different events for U.S. holidays, like if it's a Halloween party or Easter party or um, just sometimes random events. Um, so that's always a good circle. And everywhere we've been, there's been other member families. And really? I think the government has a high rate of like LDS people. I know that like higher than average percentage. <laughs> yeah, compared to other. Yeah. And I think it's often because we have people who serve missions, like because we're for missionaries and they, they go overseas and they have language skills and things like that. They also, I think, recruit like... Um, because they know that, like, our church, like, we don't, like, you know, because to work for the government, you can't do drugs. You have to pass yeah. polygraph. Yeah. You can't have criminal background yeah. or anything like that. Morally high standards. Yeah, yeah. So there's always, even if we're in, like, a smaller embassy, like Malaysia or Bolivia, we always have other member families. So we've never, ever been just, like, the only member. That's And cool. there's there's there LDS Foreign Service um, Facebook groups where people can connect and then ask, like, how is this post or who else is there? And there's always, like... Like, you know, someone recently had posted like about Malaysia and I was going to be like, yeah, we loved Malaysia. Definitely go to Kuala Lumpur. It's such a great city. But there was already like five other people, you know, <laughs> were saying the exact same things that I would have said about it. So uh-huh. I was like, all right, I don't need I still commented, but didn't need to because anyway, so that's really nice. And Australia was really awesome because um, that was the main country that we really made friends with the locals, not just so I, my closest friends were embassy. They were actually just the LDS, uh, other members of our ward. And because, you know, you uh, like we're culturally more similar. Sometimes I'm like Bolivia, even though for one, we had a language barrier, but then it was harder. In the Philippines, we also have had an expat ward. There's a lot of expats in the Philippines. So it was the same thing. Like I actually didn't get to know the locals as well because our church experience was with other expats from different different not just the u.s different countries but it wasn't it was english speaking you know so yeah yeah it's been kind of fun so have you in any of those countries been in a ward where they don't speak english that was the last one in bolivia, in bolivia. yeah and that was hard that was one of the reasons we felt like we needed to leave is because our first we had virtual um church for a very long time because Bolivia was really hardcore about COVID. <laughs> and so... So did you do... Did you, like, chime in on somebody in the U.S.'s virtual uh, they would They would just do, like, sacrament meet. Like, well, at first it was just, like, everyone just did home church. So it wasn't, oh, yeah, like, there was right. no, no like, you know... And then they only allowed some people so then we could watch it. Uh-huh. So we should have done that and zoomed in. I should have just asked somebody else. But... <laughs> But it was like, the same it was so, <gasps> but at that point, like I said, Bolivia stayed virtual church because the government didn't allow it long, a long time different of when the America was back in person. So there wasn't really any like church to join in, you know. So have you had any callings in any of those wards that have been unique or even just spiritually like a growth experience? Yeah, let me try to think. So, yeah, I think in all of all of them, really, like in Australia, 
I was um, first in Young Women's, the Young Women's Presidency. Yeah. And then I was called to be in the stake Young Women's, which was fun because what? it was, yeah. And I was very young. So I how mean, many time, how many years at each location have you been? Uh, three years. Three. Except the Philippines, yeah. my husband did another unaccompanied tour to Afghanistan and we stayed. So the Philippines was four years. Uh-huh. But everywhere else, it's generally like three years. And then, okay. but Bolivia, because we left six months early, was two and okay, a half Okay, so years. in that three years in Australia, you went from yeah. war to yeah. stake level <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah but it was really fun like I really enjoyed it because I mean like I said I only had my first daughter was born while we were posted in Australia and so she was just a baby during that time so it wasn't, it wasn't so too I remember we went to like a camp it was this really cool camp and they it just because of the location, it was like, you know, among the eucalyptus trees and it was just so pretty, but I took her with me and it was just, it was just fun. I enjoyed that calling, but then I was only in that calling for a year because again, then we, we left. And then in the Philippines, I never had, I'd been in young women's when we were, we moved back to the U S those two years, I've been in the ward for like a month and I got called to be young women's president in that ward. What? <laughs> And I was pregnant with my second, and my husband was traveling well for work, and I was, like, oh, so overwhelmed. I was, like, wait, I don't know the girl. I don't know who to call. I'm, like, how can I call You're any, like, like, counselors if I don't know anybody yeah. at all? So that was, like, ah. And so, but, and before that, you know, I'd been in college. So I hadn't had, like, um, yeah, I had been young women's in that. And then, so in the Philippines, I was in primary until the very end. And then I was called um, to be a counselor in Relief Society, which was just fun, this fun, exciting novelty. But then my son, who was like about two at the time, the embassy was worried about like his growth, that he was too small. And then we'd gone to a local doctor who was kind of crazy and was like, he needs growth hormones. And the U.S. embassy doctors were like, "Uh, you need to go see an endocrinologist in the U.S. So they, they medevaced us back to the States. And at that point, it was supposed to just be short, but I was pregnant with my third daughter. And so, and then you can't fly back to the country, you know, like after you're so far along. So then I needed to stay, but you can't return to post until the baby's (laughs) six weeks. So I ended up being gone a long time. And so I was, yeah, I was really sad by the time we returned to the Philippines. We only had like one month and then we had to move at that point. So that was a very short calling. I think it was like four months or something (laughs) like that. It was supposed to be like my last year, but anyway, it was short, short short-lived. And then in Malaysia, I don't remember all my callings, but the one that was just so funny is I was like in primary, I was called to be the, the music leader and I just have no music background <laughs> at all. And I was like, what? I can't even sing on pitch. Like I can't, you know, I was like, I'm the worst person for this calling, but it was kind of fun. And we had, a, it was a brand, well, I guess it was a ward, but it was like, seemed like more like branch size. We didn't have that many. We didn't break up into classes even because we probably had 20 well, probably less than 20 kids, like 15 kids total or something like that. So maybe we just did the older kids and the younger kids. But anyway, that was kind of like, it, it kind of brought me out of my comfort zone. I had to learn about make, you know, making the little posters for singing. Uh-huh. And like, I don't know, it was just something I'd never done anything like that. Yeah. <laughs> so that was fun. But then the Philippines, like, I mean, not the Philippines, sorry. Um, Bolivia, like I'd mentioned, it was mostly virtual. So at the end, I was called back into Young Women's, but it was... Um, It was nice because then I had two girls, young woman age, and that was fun. But it was only the same thing, like a matter of months till we moved at that point. And before that, we didn't have a calling. My husband, he didn't get a calling while there. Again, it was just hard with the language barrier. My friend, um, her husband spoke fluent Spanish. So he was like called to the bishopric right away. (laughs) Oh, yeah, for sure. (laughs) But but when you don't know the language, that is kind of hard. So yeah. anyway, yeah. Your heritage comes from... From both your grandma and grandpa? Um, no, sorry. So, so my, just from your just grandpa? My, yeah, just my grandfather, yeah. Okay. So my mom's dad. Your your family raised at all traditionally? Um, well, my grandfather, he actually wrote a book. It's called In Search of Spirit. And it's kind of like our family's history of, and I think with the, like reclaiming what was lost in the boarding school. And my grandfather, he had joined the church, but he kind of 
fell away. Well, he'd not kind of, he did leave the church, but he never was against it. And in fact, I didn't find out until like right before he passed away one time when it was conference, general conference, he mentioned like, oh yeah, I always listen to general conference. I love to hear. And I was like, really? Because I didn't like, who are you? Yeah. I was like, I didn't know that, but he wanted for him. It was like, he needed to like reconnect with his like native. I mean, he always had these values and teachings he told me so many wonderful like stories and like the like the wisdom was always there from when I can remember but he didn't grow up like he you know like the same way and he didn't actually know who his father was his his mom like to her deathbed never told anybody who his dad was and then he you know so he has a lot of his half brothers um from like her second marriage um but he didn't know his own father, which is why I think he was so into like um, that whole like sense of identity from knowing who you are. And he he worked with um, adoptions for a long time, where he he helped people fi- who were adopted with sealed adoptions find their birth parents. That's and he awesome. told me, and I, I wish I knew like before he passed away. I hope it's still somewhere at his house. He said he had this, he's like, if you're ever interested, I have a box of letters that people would write to me thanking me for helping them find their birth parents and how much it meant to them that like, Did you know. Did you get that box? Uh, not yet. Who but has it? <laughs> it Who has still, it? I know, it still should be with my grandma. Yeah. So I'm going to go. I haven't actually, because it was COVID, he passed away in COVID. We weren't able to do like a funeral and then we moved to Bolivia and so I haven't been um, he's up in Spokane Washington and that's where like he lived and that's where my grandma is Um, she's my step grandma but we are close so I need to go up and visit and get some of those special things (laughs) that's so cool yeah it is really cool so anyway he wasn't against the church but he did had left the church but my mom grew up in the church um, and that was you know part of her life and so in terms of the native things it really has been more recent I would say like I said after my grandpa's passing is when I was like what else can I do to like embrace this part of my identity and teach my children as well and so my whole family like my siblings as well like I know you'll have hopefully my sister will be on your podcast but like after her son passed away that was when she the same was even more like on this journey of reconnection for the healing that it brings and it has helped them so much And so it's also just increased my gratitude for an interest to like go deeper, read more books or whatever it takes. Like I said, listening to your podcast, like just anything that helps me feel more connected or to learn more. And it's amazing because I feel so much peace and love and just the more I'm like learning about my native heritage, the more I also just feel closer to Christ and just feel just happier but I don't know it's kind of hard to explain but it's like the right path because they're both just helping me you know well I I totally I agree with that I think that the more we learn about any of our ancestors Mm -hmm. and the hard things that they experienced the Mm -hmm. the things that um their qualities their the way people perceive them like even if it was negative we should learn from that to be like mm-hmm, hmm, exactly I don't want to be like that yeah and learn the good things and try to to emulate that in in our lives so whatever our heritage mm-hmm. is that's going to bring us closer to Christ as we emulate those those good qualities like that yeah. list that you just shared with us about the the uh qualities yeah like I mean virtues, yeah we all should be seeking to have those right yeah exactly yeah yeah it's very true I think that yeah and it was something that I didn't even find the same thing till after um my grandpa passed away these like Lakota virtues is because there is like they're written out with this picture of Chief Sitting Bull and so he was um, a great 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 uncle And so I was always, and so I was telling that to my kids. I'm like, and they didn't know, but they were like, who's Chief Sitting Bull? (laughs) I was like, wait, what? I have not done a good job teaching you, you know, because they didn't even know who he was. But I was like, you need to learn these things. Um, And I don't know, like what these people stood for, like Chief Sitting Bull and the other chiefs who were the last people to be like trying to, you know, save their people. Yeah. Um, they, They were good good men in many ways beyond just that they were trying to like yeah 
defend their land you know <laughs> well they some of them were prophets yeah i mean exactly not the prophet on the earth but they were prophets yeah it's true yeah i agree and it's good that we have so i wish there was more of their wisdom like recorded in that i you know like there are some certain books like black elk speaks and there's definitely some but i'm like i wish that i had more opportunity and I even same with my grandfather it wasn't until he passed like there's been so many things that I wish I could talk to him I would have asked him now that it's too late though and so I'm still you know on this journey of learning but it's it's important that we do what we can now because there's every generation you know it's like like for me well like my children are not enough like native blood to be registered in their tribe like that ends with me and and that's just something that's like I don't want to be like the end now now we're not native anymore like you're not registered like it should be beyond that I don't want them just to feel like because they're not enrolled that they are less native than they are because it's you know it's um it's still a part of us forever (laughs) so anyway yeah I know I I agree. I, like I said, the more you learn about your ancestors and our prophet now, President Nelson and mm-hmm. other uh, apostles have promised us mm-hmm. that as we do family history and as we learn about where we come from, especially if we know their names, they'll be attending to us. They'll, yeah. they'll be angels in our in our midst. Yeah, it's true. My sister has had some really cool temple experiences with family names, things that have come up since, because since her son has passed away, they go to the temple now every single week because that's where they feel the closest to him. And um, they've just had some really cool things happen in terms of like, because we've been kind of stuck on our family history side. Like for, for my grandfather, he could only go like seven, like he, we were the seventh generation as far back as he could go. And then since he had passed away, we have found who like, it was like chief, um, chief medicine cow was as far back as we could go. But now we know who chief's met, who chief medicine cow's parents are. And that was so amazing. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And that How really cool. cool? Is that? It's so cool. So yeah, it's just been so neat. And then like, I will have been having more native names that have come up to do their temple work that wasn't there before. So anyway, and she has some really special stories, but those are her stories, but it's really cool. <laughs> that is so cool. Yeah. It's yeah. Amazing. You are such a great storyteller. I've just been enthralled oh, oh, and I'm you. so grateful for you coming. But I do have one final question. What does it mean to you to know that you belong to the tribe of Israel? This is a good question. Um, to me, I feel very grateful. Like we know we talked a lot today about gratitude. I'm very grateful that I belong to the tribe of Israel or the gospel in general is a part of my life. But I also think that um, something that comes to mind is just how there's a covenant associated with being part of the house of Israel. And that is that we, like Abraham, are supposed to bless God's children. And so to me, one thing that I feel like is that I think there's a plan and a purpose for everybody's life. And for me, I know that we've lived in these countries that we've talked about. You know, I've been all of these places. It wasn't like a random place that we were, but rather that we were there because of the opportunities that we had to bless God's children in those places. Like that's something my patriarchal blessing talks about a lot is like doing God's charitable works here on earth. And so I know, and I know that's not over yet. Like even if I don't go back overseas, you can continue to do that anywhere. But I just like that part of that covenant because I think about like how with our native um, ancestors, it was always like wealth was determined not by how much somebody had, but how much they were able to give away. Like that was something that determined wealth. And that's because I think they knew that like you were blessing yourself when you bless others. And so I'm just, it makes sense to me why that's part of that covenant is to bless God's children, but it's also helping us. And so that's just one thing. I mean, that there's so much with that question. I could go many directions, yeah. but yeah. that is something that comes to mind and I think is important. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me tonight. It's been a lot of fun Thanks. to talk it to you. Thanks. been fun. <laughs> Thanks. I've been sitting here trying to think what to share with you today. 
And I did once ages and ages and ages ago sing to you. I know I don't have perfect pitch, but I like to sing. And I get to sing in a stake choir uh, for an Easter celebration, an Easter concert that we're doing. And it's going to be really good. So if you're in the area, you're invited. Um, but we are singing a bunch of songs. Uh, we are singing Christ the Lord is Risen Today. We are singing It Is Well With My Soul. We are singing I Know That My Redeemer Lives. And we are also singing One by One by by David A. Bednar. I'm not going to sing the whole thing to you because it's in parts, but I want to sing some of it to you. So here it goes. One by one, one by one, Jesus the Father's beloved Son. One by one, one by one, from the beginning said thy will be done. Jesus Christ came to earth to fulfill God's plan, for he alone could atone as Savior of man. The Lord blessed and beckoned them, come unto me, and willingly sacrifice to set us free. One by one, one by one, he suffered for us and victory won. One by one, one by one, we marvel at all his love has done. One by one. Okay. I did not sing good actual notes for everything. I don't have a piano accompaniment. And anyway, didn't do it. But I hope you get the gist. Um, one by one, one by one, multitudes gathered and saw him come. One by one, one by one, each heard a voice declare, Behold my son, Jesus Christ came and stood in the midst of them all. They fell to the earth in great reverence for him. The Lord bid us arise and come forth unto me. With hands they did feel and with eyes they did see. One by one, one by one, each knew and bore record, he is our Lord. One by one, one by one, they cried Hosanna with one accord, one by one. One by one, one by one, Christ looked around him and saw their tears. One by one, one by one. In his compassion, he calmed their fears. Jesus Christ healed each one, brought forth unto him. Then he blessed each precious child and prayed for them. The angels descended from heaven above, encircling those little ones. Each felt his love. One by one, one by one, he intercedes for each daughter and son. One by one, one by one. Strength from his grace gives his power to become. One by one, one by one. I hope you actually find that somewhere and listen to it. Uh, it's amazing. And I am grateful for our Savior. I'm grateful for the Easter time that will be coming. That we can think about him coming forth from the tomb. For all that he did before the tomb and for his miraculous um, gift to us. He does love us one by one. He loves you. He loves me. He loves us one by one. 
and I hope that gives you something to think about and maybe smile about and I hope you have a super wonderful awesome day. Tribe of Testimonies is not sponsored by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The music is a traditional hymn, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing, arranged and performed by Kyle Forsyth. I would love to hear from you. I would love to hear how this podcast is affecting you. And I'm always looking for guests. If you or someone you know would be a great guest, you can reach me at tribeoftestimonies at gmail.com.